So it's uh, my very great pleasure to introduce to you Clifford, who is going to talk about um, a very complex topic I know very little about, but that's probably going to change now. Um, so please give a warm round of applause for a free and open source very lock to bitstream flow for ICE 40 FPGAs. Thank you. Um, so I'm talking about the free and open source very lock to bitstream flows for ICE 40 FPGAs. And uh, in particular, that means I'm going to talk about three projects. Uh, because these uh, three projects together form this um, free and open source very to bitstream uh, flow for this kind of FPGAs. Um, the projects I'm going to talk about are uh, Project iStorm. And Project iStorm is an effort to uh, reverse engineer and document the bitstream format for ICE40 FPGAs. And um, in particular, uh, right now we support the HX1K and HX8K um, FPGAs. Um, in theory, we should only also support the LP1K and LP8K, um, if there is such a one, I don't know, um, FPGAs, because they uh, just have different timings, but the bitstream format is uh, absolutely identical. Um, so from the iStorm project, we get uh, documentation for the bitstreams, uh, documentation as well as in, in human readable form, as well as in machine readable form, so we can um, write other tools that do them useful things with this uh, kind of devices. Um, and also from Project iStorm, we have a couple of uh, tools that we can use to um, read bitstream files for those FPGAs and uh, convert uh, those bitstream for, uh, files into different uh, formats and, and vice versa. The second project I'm going to talk about is um, Arachne PNR. And Arachne PNR is a, a place and route tool for the ICE40 FPGAs. And it's based on the iStorm uh, documentation. So I wrote the iStorm documentation, uh, and then I was lucky enough to uh, find someone uh, um, Cotton C, this is name, uh, to write this Arachne PNR place and route to based um, on the documentation I wrote. The third project I'm going to talk about is uh, Yosis. And Yosis um, actually is my kind of main project that I'm uh, working on now for a little bit over three years. Um, and Yosis, um, Yosis is a huge project, but uh, Simply said, it's a Verilog synthesis uh, suite. So when you have uh, hardware designs that are written in Verilog, you can use Yosis to synthesize uh, those designs to netlists for um, a variety of, of different architectures. Um, and one of those architectures is the ICE40 um, FPGA architecture. Um, but I also have support for other FPGA series is there. I have uh, support for ASIC synthesis. And they also uh, support various uh, formal verification flows um, in users. And I'm going to talk about this um, a little bit. Not very much, just, just a little bit. Um, and last but not least, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, the ICO board. Uh, the ICO board is um, a development board featuring the ICE40 uh, FPGAs. Um, and I'm also showing you a little demo. And uh, that's this contraption here. Uh, we are going to uh, yeah, use this uh, at the end of the talk. So this is uh, the, the flow, the big overview for the flow. Um, you see uh, you start with uh, Verilog sources um, and the synthesis script. Usually the synthesis script just reads the Verilog files and then executes um, a few macro commands that do everything that is necessary um, to synthesize for the specified target. Um, and of course, we are looking at the ICE40 FPGA here in particular. The output of, of users in this case is a BLIF file. Um, BLIF is a very easy, uh, a very simple netlist format. Um, and it's one of many formats that Yosis supports um, as, as, as backends. We, uh, we've made some extensions to the BLIF file format to um, enable the use of, of additional attributes on cells and parameters, which is uh, quite useful when you do, for example, FPGA synthesis and would like to have like, the LUT configuration as part uh, of, of a cell instantiation um, as a kind of parameter. Then we take this netlist in the BLIF uh, uh, file, 
and we pass it on to Arachne PNR, the uh, place and route tool written by Cottonseed. Um, and we also give Arachne PNR a few additional files. Namely, we give it a physical constraints file that specifies where um, each pin should go on the, uh, where each input or output of the design should, should go on the device to which pin it should uh, map. Um, Optionally, you can also specify a, a place and route script that tells Arachne PNR um, what, what strategy it should uh, follow and uh, what, what of its internal passes it should uh, execute in, in, in what order. The output of that is uh, what I call an ice storm text file. Uh, this is already a very, very low level file format. We will see a short example of that um, where you can uh, see for each individual tile just the asks you block of, of zeros and ones and then you know okay in, in line eight and uh, column 13 is bit that has this or that function. Um, and lastly we, we pass this uh, ISTOM text file to IcePack and IcePack is a very simple tool that can convert this uh, easy to read uh, text file into the binary representation that must be passed to the FPGA in order to use um, this design. Yeah, so uh, let's look at the uh, first of those uh, four uh, projects, the first uh, part of my talk, uh, Project Icestorm. Um, first, I, sh I think I should give you a little overview uh, over the ICE-40 FPGA series because the ICE-40 FPGAs are not um, um, very widely used. I mean, a lot of people use, use Xilinx devices or Altera devices, but uh, let this ICE-40 uh, kind, of, kind of niche. Uh, so it's a, a family of small FPGAs. The, the largest one has a little bit under 8,000 uh, uh, LUTs, and the LUTs are small four input uh, LUTs. Um, the FPGA itself is of course a kind of grid of tiles and a different kind of tiles. Um, there are logic tiles and those logic tiles have, have eight uh, lookup tables and for each of those lookup tables an optional flip-flop and uh, a carry chain logic that you can uh, use optionally. There are also RAM tiles for, for block memory. Uh, they all always come in pairs. There is always a RAM bottom tile and a RAM top tile. Uh, and the bottom tile and the top tile together, uh, they uh, form a four kilobyte SRAM. And of course, there are um, I.O. tiles on the edges of, uh, of these grids that uh, connect to the programmable I.O. pins, but um, also provide the infrastructure necessary to connect the um, FPGA logic with other resources on the chip like PLLs and global nets. A nice thing uh, about uh, ice 40 FPGAs is that they come in quite reasonable packages. Uh, so when you would like to make your own uh, boards, it can be quite a hassle to work with uh, ball grid arrays and stuff like that. But uh, the ice 40 FPGAs uh, come in, in packages like a 144 pin TQFP uh, that you can even solder by hand if you have to. Um, and also there are very cheap development boards available from Lattice directly for, for this kind of, of FPGAs. The Lattice Ice Stick uh, costs less than $25, so it's uh, really affordable for someone who just would like to um, experiment with it and have a quick, quick go with it. Um, also, if you would like to do some low-level stuff and are afraid of maybe breaking your dev board by, by fiddling with the configuration bits manually, uh, then it's, it's quite nice to have a uh, dev board in this price range where nothing is, uh, yeah, where you can, can simply replace it. So in summary, the, the FPGA looks a little bit like that. We have this, uh, this, this, this grid of, of, of PLBs, uh, programming logic blocks. These are the, the logic tiles. Uh, we have some, some memory tiles that span two uh, rows. Um, and we have the, the um, I.O. tiles on the, on, on the edges. Um, and then in the middle of that slide, we have a, a more detailed look into one of these uh, logic tiles, uh, where we see we have these eight uh, flip-flops, eight uh, uh, carry chain elements, um, and eight lookup tables. Um, this is also blown up here, uh, so we can see it in more detail. However, this is still just... Uh, 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 um, 
it, it's still missing stuff. For example, there is a, a connection that goes directly from one LUT output to the uh, second LUT input of the next uh, uh, um, look in lookup table in this chain, bypassing the, the, the flip-flop. Um, yeah, and, and the bottom right you see, this is the iStick dev board that you can buy from Lattice uh, for under $25. I think it costs $25 from Lattice, but on Mauser it's under $25. Good, so with Project iStorm, we, we had a detailed look at these FPGAs and we uh, documented the Bitstream format and we wrote these low-level tools that can be used to work with, with Bitstreams. Um, and we also defined a very simple text file that can be used to just specify each and every individual bit uh, in the configuration. And on the right on this slide, you see a little excerpt of what this uh, text file looked like. So you have... Uh, here, logic tile 99, and these are, of course, the coordinates. And then you just have this, this block of, of, of ones um, and zeros. And when you, can, when, you, when you look up the documentation online that uh, we provided, then you can uh, decipher that and say, OK, this bit is, is set because it has this function, and this kind of makes sense for what uh, this configuration does. So with the ice to to um, tools, we can convert between the text files and the binary files. Um, and uh, we can also do a lot of other interesting stuff. For example, we can take one of those text files and convert it back into a behavioral Verilog model. Um, and actually, when I released this feature the first time, I got quite some hate mail from people who thought I want to steal their IP or something. Um, you can also create timing netlists uh, from these bitstreams directly. However, this is under construction. Um, it, it's almost done, but not quite uh, yet. Um, the reason why we are doing things like that always on this low-level bitstream format is because we can create these files from our own flow, but we can also create it for the bitstream files generated by a lattices flow. Uh, so it's very easy to verify if our interpretation of the, uh, of the bitstream is, is correct. We just create random Verilog designs. Uh, pass it through the lattice flow, then convert the output back into something that is behavioral Verilog, and then use something like the formal verification features in users to check uh, if the Verilog we started with and the Verilog we got out at the end are formally equivalent. So uh, you, you can go to clifford.at slash iStorm and, and browse the documentation I wrote. Uh, a little bit of warning here, it's, uh, uh, it's a reference, it's not, it's not like an introductory textbook. So if you uh, uh, don't know anything about how FPGAs work entire, uh, internally, it might be uh, a hard read. Um, also, it's um, actually not very well structured, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but it's not very long, it's just a few pages. So my recommendation, if you really would like to know how these FPGAs work, uh, and what the individual bit means is to just read the entire thing once and then you have uh, an, an overview where what is and, and for example, most of the interconnect is explained in the, uh, on the page for the logic tiles and things like, like PLLs and global nets are uh, explained on the, on the page that, that cover the I.O. tiles. Um, but it's, it's really small and you can, can read it in, in, in maybe an hour or two, so it's, uh, I think, not so bad. Um, so the, the things provided by, uh, by Project iStorm, uh, besides the, uh, the actual tool, the documentation provided is, is uh, a written documentation that gives you an overview. Then there is an auto-generated HTML documentation that uh, gives you the reference, what each bit exactly means. Um, and there is also an auto-generated ASCII database that can be used in other tools like Arachne PNR to uh, do something with this uh, kind of FPGAs. And here I have a couple of screenshots from this uh, documentation. So on the, on the lower left, you have uh, some of the written documentation that covers, uh, this is actually from the, from the um, I.O. tile, and you see uh, the column buffer uh, control bits that are used for the global nets and stuff like that is documented here. Um, then the uh, two screenshots with this, this, this uh, wonderfully colored tables. This uh, uh, the automatically generated uh, uh, HTML documentation where we document the function of each and every individual bit, um, and, and most of them in, in, in more than, than just one way. So we have uh, 
um, in this case, some, some matrices that can tell us which nets can be connected to which other nets uh, and, and what bits uh, are used for that. Uh, and here on the upper right, you actually see uh, for, for one logic tile, the, the entire um, collection of bits we have reverse engineered. Um, so you see there are some, <laughs> you see there are some, uh, some gray areas. Um, and um, as far as I can tell, it's not the things that I have missed, but uh, these bits are just not used. Um, I can't be sure, of course, but I didn't manage to create any Verilog design that would use those bits, so I think it's a pretty fair guess that they're actually unused. And on the, on the bottom right, you see uh, a part of the interconnect uh, documentation, um, and you can, can see things like this, this uh, interconnect lines are pairwise crossed out and, and stuff like that, so it, it took us quite a while to, to figure out all this, uh, these details. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's Project iStorm, that's the low-level stuff. Um, and of course, it's very interesting to just see how the FPGA works and to know what each and every individual bit does. But this doesn't really give us something that we can, can use for like, like everyday design work with, with FPGAs. So uh, part two, Arachne PNR, this is the place and route tool uh, that uh, Cotton Seed wrote. Uh, this now takes this Blif netlist uh, and converts it into one of those text files. Um, so it performs essentially the, this operations here. It, it, uh, it instantiates I.O. cells uh, um, and clock buffers. This is more like a convenience feature, but it's something that is quite usual for, for place and route or low-level implementation tools to do something like that. Um, it packs looks and carry logics and flip-flop instances into ICE4G logic cells because the architecture netlist uh, has individual lookup tables and carry logic blocks and, and flip-flops, and we need to figure out uh, how we can fit them um, into this, uh, this logic cells. Um, then we place the design. Uh, this is currently um, done by simulated annealing only, uh, but we are working on a flow that, uh, that would use like a, a, a first step that um, uh, um, that does an analytical placement and then we refine it using simulated annealing. Uh, then of course it routes the design and then it dumps the, the FPGA uh, config. So how does this input netlist format really look like this, this BLIF file? Um, we use the same cell types that are used uh, for the, by the lattice tools themselves. So we, we stick to the ice 40 technology library, uh, which allows us to to mix our own tool chain with the lattice tool chain and for example use, use our front end and then go into the lattice back end or vice versa. Um, Blif is a pretty easy file format and you see a simple example um, here, uh, dot model, that's just a statement for, for um, um, Blif calls it model but in Verilog you would say a, a module. Um, and then you have a list of inputs and outputs. Every net that are used but not declared as inputs and outputs are just internal wires. Um, and in this case, the entire design is just a single uh, lookup table, a single SPLUT4 uh, with uh, these four inputs and one output. And here you see our non-standard dot param statement that is used to set the uh, lookup uh, table for, for this particular uh, LUT4 instance. But you can also um, put additional input files into the uh, iStorm flow. Uh, for example, you can uh, give it a physical constraint file, as I mentioned already, uh, that is primarily used for I.O. placement. And once again, we try to do something that looks very similar to uh, the file formats used by the lattice tools. So it's easy to, uh, to switch between back and forth between our tool chain and the lattice tool chain. Um, you can also use a place and route script. This is a more experimental feature that is in development right now, where you can uh, manually specify what steps should be taken in which order and also give uh, the individual passes additional parameters. Um, and with that, we have already uh, an experimental flow working where you use the analytical placer in Yosus together with Arachne PNR. But that's not actually what I would like to do in, in the end with analytical placement because the analytical placement in Yosus doesn't really know um, um, how the, the FPGA looks like and that there are only certain places where a RAM tile can go, for example. 
So, and the output format of Arachnid PNR on the other side are, of course, this, this iStorm um, ASC files. And as I've said, they can be converted to uh, the things that you would like to do with them uh, with the iStorm um, low level tools. But of course, you can also create additional outputs like a placement file that uh, contains all the placement that are generated automatically during uh, uh, placement, or a BLIF netlist of, for example, the packed uh, design, uh, because this is something that you might want to investigate. So this is the, the, the second part of our flow, Arachne PNR. Now we can take uh, a technology netlist and actually implement it on uh, the, 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 um, the chip. So uh, theoretically, we could already create very minimalistic designs, but it's uh, yeah, not, not, not how you would usually like to do it. Um, so in the third part, we are going to look at Yosus, and Yosus, as I've said, is my, my main project. It's uh, uh, the tool that can actually take HDL designs written in Verilog and convert them to whatever you would like to uh, use in the end. Um, so this is a small excerpt of what you can do with, with Yosus. You can read various file formats, and most importantly, you can uh, read Verilog. And in this case, Verilog is pretty much everything from Verilog 2005. So uh, it, it's pretty much up to date. Um, however, as you can see, there is no VHDL front end uh, at, at the moment. There are people who are saying they, they would like to work on that. and. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious to find out what, uh, what we will see in a year or so. You can write various file formats. Of course, you can write a Verilog netlist, uh, which can be interesting for things like uh, post-synthesis simulation. But you can also write BLIF netlists. You can write EDIF netlists, uh, which is very important if you would like to go into a commercial backend, because they usually use EDIF as a netlist exchange format and, and some other format. Um, you can, of course, uh, perform RTL synthesis and uh, also logic optimization. Some of the optimization is done in Yosis directly, and some of the optimization uses an external tool from uh, the Berkeley University called ABC, which is used for like low-level logic optimization. Um, and you can, of course, map designs uh, to target architectures, like uh, certain FPGA architect architectures or A6L libraries. Um, and you can also perform uh, formal verifications, uh, which is uh, actually the thing I maybe spend most time on, on, on working. Um, some have said that Yosus is something like LLVM for hardware. Uh, I, I really like this, this, this idea, and I like this analogy. But uh, there are a couple of, of, of projects at the moment that try to become the LLVM uh, for hardware, so I can't really claim that title yet. So what, what kind of flows do really exist? Of course, there exist many more flows that are implemented with users, but uh, most of them are like one, one person building a custom flow, which is part of their PhD thesis work or something like that. So these are the, the flows that um, are like uh, more general and something that, that, that you'd actually might want to use as it is. Um, there are two ASIC flows that use Yosus as, uh, as front end. Um, there's Qflow and there's Coriolis 2. Uh, and uh, both of them have been already used to tape out chips. Uh, for Qflow, I also know that uh, people have taped out commercial chips with that. Uh, so, so this is something that is actually in use, and it's not like a, a thought experiment. And theoretically, we could, it's actually done. Um, then, of course, there is the synthesis for IS-40 FPGH, uh, which is the flow I'm talking about right now. Um, and then there is uh, a flow for Xilinx 7 series FPGAs. But uh, with test flow, we don't have any open source uh, implementation backend to do things like place and route. So uh, you, you could use Yosus to do the synthesis, but then you would still need to use something like Xilinx Vivado to, to do the actual implementation. Um, and of course, there are a few formal verification flows. Um, and um, I think uh, the most interesting one is Yosus SMT BMC that's uh, used uh, to 
uh, perform formal verifications using standalone SMT solvers by writing files uh, in, in SMT2 format. And SMT2 is the format that is used for the competitions for SMT solvers. So this means we have no vendor lock-in whatsoever because every SMT solver uh, that is going to be written will support the SMT2 file format because they want to compete in these competitions. So what does uh, Yosef's synthesis script look like? Um, and it's something like this here. Um, you have a usually a generic part that is just, oh, read these design files, um, and then uh, some kind of synthesis command. Um, there is here the, the very generic synth command. Um, and then you have a target-specific part that does the mapping to the target architecture, in this case, an, an ASIC cell library. Um, but of course, this, this looks very much like it looks when, when you look into commercial ASIC uh, flows. They, they usually look quite similar, that you have something like a tickle script and it reads a few Verilog files and then it calls one command that does the magic synthesis part. Um, but in Yosus, this synth command is actually a script itself that is just a sequence of other commands. And when you look into the help message for the synth command, then you see uh, this, this script that is actually used uh, behind the scenes. And some of those commands, like proc or opt or FSM or memory, are themselves just sequences of other commands. So it's quite easy to, uh, to look at this and actually understand what, what steps are taken in sequence to turn a high-level description of a design into a low-level netlist for the given target architecture. Uh, and it's, of course, also possible to do things like stop synthesis at, at any given point here and then dump this intermediate netlist and, and see what, what's going on. Yeah, um, as I've mentioned already, formal verification is something that is uh, very important for me. Uh, so I, I had to have a slide here about different formal verification uh, methods that can be used with users. There is a built-in SAT solver uh, that can be used to answer simple questions like, uh, is there any sequence of, of, uh, of, of N uh, time steps where in the end, uh, the signal A is high and the signal B is low, and then it will try to find uh, such a sequence. Um, I actually use this uh, quite a lot when, when, when doing larger FPGA designs, and then you have to instrument them with something like an on-chip debugger, and you only can uh, have so many signals that you look at in your on-chip debugger, so you end up with a debug trace that says something like, oh, this signal is high and this signal is low, and that time step, and you look at this and you wonder, how, how is this even possible? I don't see how this is possible. And usually, you would uh, need to uh, uh, resynthesize the entire design and add more signals to, to find out what happened to those signals so that they end up in this state. But with this technology, you can just uh, take the design and say, I have observed that these two signals uh, go to this state. What can cause this? And it will give you an answer. There is a large framework for equivalence checking, which is very important if you do things like writing a synthesis tool, because you would like to make sure that the output of your synthesis tool is formally equivalent to the input. So I, I added uh, uh, that. Um, you can uh, do uh, uh, property checking using meter circuits with the built-in solver and with external solvers, like an ABC there, uh, solvers that can be used for that. And of course, there is this user's SMT BMC flow that I mentioned uh, before. So this is, this is the flow. With these three tools, we can, uh, we can implement everything we, uh, we, we need. We can, we can build designs. So, uh, so how do we do this? Uh, first, we need a development board. Um, and, and luckily, there are a lot of development boards um, available. So from Lattice, there are a few uh, ones. Uh, but there are also a lot of open hardware development boards. Um, and I'm not sure uh, what's the percentage of them that have been inspired by the availability of this open source uh, uh, flow, or uh, uh, which of those uh, have been like planned already before I, I published my work. Um, but. Uh, in the lower left corner, you see the ICO board, and the ICO board is actually a project I'm involved with, so I'm going to use that for, for the demo. Um, this is the ICO board. It's a, a Raspberry Pi hat featuring the 8K FPGA. 
uh, and it uh, supports up to 20 PMOD ports when, uh, when you use uh, IQX extension spores that are connected to these FlatFlex connectors. Uh, so uh, in total, you have almost 200 I.O. pins on a Raspberry Pi with that. Um, and I think this is something that can be useful even if you're not really interested in an open source FPGA toolchain. Um, so there are a couple of applications. Uh, of course, you can just make an intelligent Raspberry Pi I.O. expander uh, that does a little bit more than just uh, exposing um, um, I.O.s. You can use the Raspberry Pi as a network enabled uh, programmer and debugger, which is uh, quite useful. Um, and uh, one, one idea that I like very much is you can actually create HDL code on the fly on the Raspberry Pi and synthesize it on the Raspberry Pi and, and, and program it into the uh, FPGA without going to, to any external workstation uh, that does the synthesis and bitstream generation step for you. So we've built a small uh, demo SOC and uh, I have, have two motivations for that. The first one is I would like to convince you that uh, this tool chain can actually be used for non-trivial designs uh, and not just small Hello World examples. Um, and the second thing is this is a very small FPGA. Uh, so I would like to convince you that even with something that only has 8,000 LUTs, you can uh, do uh, interesting things. Um, so my, my demo, uh, uh, design here, my demo system on a chip, uses only about 50% of the logic resources on this FPGA. Uh, so it could also be very interesting as a basis for other projects because you still have half of the device for whatever you would like to add. Um, and it includes a fully featured 32-bit processor uh, that's uh, compatible with the RISC-V instruction set. So you can use GCC toolchain and stuff like that to, uh, to build um, programs for that. Um, and in this demo, the Raspberry Pi is only used as a network-enabled debugger and to access the console part of the system on a chip. Uh, it doesn't do anything else. Um, so this is a simplified block diagram of, uh, of my, my demo. Um, you see I, uh, all, all the thing in, in, in pink is something that runs on the FPGA uh, itself. Uh, and you see the external components are like the Raspberry Pi that's connected to this IcoLink core that uh, implements a, a half duplex bit parallel communication link between the Raspberry Pi and the FPGA. Uh, and IcoLink goes to various endpoints on the, uh, on the FPGA. There is an on-chip debugger. Uh, there is uh, an endpoint that can be used to upload programs into the FPGA system. There is a, a text console, uh, stuff like that. There is a 32 bit system bus that connects all the uh, components in the system. Um, um, like all those endpoints, then uh, the, the internal block memory, the SRAM controller that connects to the external SRAM. We have a frame buffer here to talk to this LED matrix. We have a GPIO controller to access all the GPIO pins. We have, of course, the processor core itself, um, and we have some, some logic for clock management. So how do we synthesize something like this? In, in this case, we are just using a make file. Um, and here are the relevant make rules. And you see the three steps uh, that I had already on the first slide. Uh, I use Yosus to uh, read the Verilog uh, code, uh, synthesize it, and, and write it into a blif file. Then I use Arachne PNR to take that blif file and the placement constraint file and to turn it into uh, a text file, a text representation of the FPGA bitstream, and then I use IcePack to convert this text representation into the actual binary file that can be programmed into the FPGA. Um, there are additional make rules when you look up the project um, to, to build the actual firmware and stuff like that using the RISC-V compiler toolchain, uh, and there are also additional make rules for, uh, uh, for programming. And, um, there is a tool called IcoProc that runs on the Raspberry Pi, and we can either run it locally. Uh, in that case, SSH Raspi is just SH-C, so it's just using a shell to start this program locally. But SSH Raspi can also be just a call to SSH to uh, use SSH to connect to, um, uh, to the Raspberry Pi. And IcoProc always reads from an input and output, so I can use just standard in and standard out for things like, oh, use this binary and uh, write it into the 
um, uh, flesh in this case. Yeah, I also mentioned the on-chip debugger core. Uh, so uh, you can just hook it up to, to any nets you would like in, in, in your design and essentially get a logic analyzer. You can write a few lines of Verilog code to define your trigger condition uh, and to define what clock cycles you would like to, to keep in memory and uh, what clock cycles you would like to ignore. Um, and with the, deep, with the default environment I have, there is a make target called make debug that just connects to the Raspberry Pi via SSH and downloads uh, a value change dump file that can be displayed in a program like, like GTK Wave. Yeah, uh, running applications on the system on the chip uh, um, looks like this. You, when it first starts, you see the, the bootloader running, and the bootloader displays this image of a floppy disk you see on the left, because that's what I think a bootloader should display. Um, then uh, there are a couple of example programs that I wrote, uh, and they just use this text console to talk to the bootloader and writes a uh, text representation of the hex uh, uh, content to, to the bootloader, and that writes it into the SRAM and then executes it. Uh, yeah, and I'd like to, to, to try that. Um, let me see. Uh, oops. Uh, um, yeah, something like that. Um, so, uh, oops. Um, let's just uh, uh, reset boot. So, hmm, that's taking too long. That's exactly what I wanted to avoid. Great. Okay, so, <laughs> so luckily I didn't suspect the software problem. So now we should see the bootloader. Uh, okay, um, and uh, let me just uh, make this a little bit smaller. So, um, oops. and then let's, for example, do this here. Uh, so, so and now we have hopefully <laughs> started <laughs> something. So. <laughs> Unfortunately, it can't go on because I don't have it here. <laughs> 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 Good. Okay. Um, so now we have this Christmas tree blinking. Uh, let's go back to the FPGA directory and say make debug. Um, so now we've downloaded 256 cycles of debug uh, data from the built in debugger. Uh, and we can just display this. Uh, so. So what's now? Well, that's great. Ah. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> second time it works. So now we have uh, downloaded some debug data, and in, in this case, I have configured the built-in debugger to, to monitor the memory bus uh, in the thing, so we can see uh, the instruction fetches, uh, and, and every now and then uh, probably a non-instruction fetch. Uh, uh, how do I? Okay, they're all instruction fetches. 256 cycles is not so, so much. Uh, okay, so, so we can see this is, I, I think, really a non-trivial system uh, and, uh, uh, and, and shows that we have a, a tool chain that can be used to do real world stuff uh, and not just very simple hello world-like uh, things. Ah, okay. Good. Uh, so how does it compare to the commercial flow? Uh, so there are two commercial flows available from, from Lattice. They both use the Lattice proprietary um, backend, the SBT backend. Uh, but uh, one of the two flows is using Simplify Pro as synthesis frontend, and the other one is using uh, Lattice LSE as, uh, as the synthesis frontend. And we are comparing that with Yosus and the Rachni uh, uh, PNR. Uh, first, there are a couple of notes for this. Uh, I, I'm using a version of the Lattice tools that is over, almost a year old, and the reason is that I have wasted a day of my life trying to activate the license for a newer version uh, and, and failed. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so I, I'm not sure how, how it would compare with, with the up-to-date uh, uh, version of the Lattice flow. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, users might not be so good when, when you look at logic optimization and what you can do with the mappings, but users is uh, astonishingly good with inferring uh, memories from behavioral code, uh, in many cases better than, uh, than, than many commercial tools. Uh, and this is also the, the case here. So when I used my design as it was uh, with the user's Arachne PNR, I had something like 22 block rams, uh, but the other two uh, tool chains had also seven and eight block rams like here, but, but like 80,000 lookup tables because they uh, f fall back to, to using uh, the, um, the logic resources to implement those memory resources because they didn't know how to do things like infer memory with byte enable for writes uh, or uh, infer memories with complex read en enables. Um, and the, uh, and for many architectures, this is not a problem, but with the ice 40 FPGAs, you have to have an output register on the block RAM. So if you don't correctly infer that read enable, you just can't use the block RAM resource anymore. So instead of uh, uh, rewriting the entire design so it works on, on all three uh, tool chains, I made a stripped down version that's uh, not using the frame buffer uh, because block RAM resources there uh, they made some troubles. Um, and I also stripped down the internal block RAM to like four words or something like that. Uh, so it, uh, it would be implemented in logic in, 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 in both cases. Um, you can see in, in terms of packed uh, logic cells, uh, the Yosef's Arachne PNR flow is a little bit worse compared to the other two flows, but it's not like the world. Um, and the main reason for that is that Yosef is at the moment too aggressive with uh, using the carry logic. So you see we have uh, almost 500 uh, uh, carry cells used, and the other flows only use 372. And because I'm too aggressive with instantiating carry cells, I oftentimes uh, uh, force a very, very small logic path to one side of the carousel and another logic path on the other side of the carousel, and I end up with a higher uh, logic utilization. Uh, so that's the main reason why, why we have this, this difference here, but I think it's not the, not the world. Um, what I find quite interesting is that synthesis is more or less the same time for all three flows. Lattice LSE is actually a little bit faster in this case. Uh, but the implementation time is, is much, much uh, smaller uh, with Arachne PNR. So Arachne PNR is much faster than the uh, proprietary uh, backend. Um, and a lot of this... 
Thank you. And a lot of this is because of, of, of constant time when the commercial tools are like loading the, uh, 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 the, the, the chip configuration and stuff like that. And because we pre cached it when you have a virtually empty design where I just, I don't know, connect an input directly to an output and nothing else, you can create a bit stream in, in under a second or maybe a second and a half. So there are a couple of links and uh, if you would like to scan this, then you get to the, to the link for this presentation where all the other links are. Um, the, the slides are already online on, on this location and I'll uh, see if I can uh, also link them in, in, the, in the proceedings online. Um, but, but if not, just go to clifford.at slash papers and then you will probably uh, find the, the link to, to this. Yeah, so uh, the people working on that, uh, on, on different parts. Uh, the list is, of course, uh, uh, incomplete, and there uh, are a lot of people who, who just uh, contributed very small but very important things, like small test cases that expose bugs uh, is something that is always very, very welcome. Um, and we also have an assembly here, so please visit us. Uh, we are on, on level uh, one, so between the blinking area and, and live until the lab that's near where the podcasters are and where the 3D printers are. Uh, we, have, we have more apps on, on this thing that you can play with if you want. Um, and we are also going to, to do uh, workshops today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow uh, at 1900. Um, so if you'd like to uh, have a hands-on experience with this kind of flow, then, then please come to, to our desk and, and register for those uh, workshops. Uh, if, if a lot of people would like to uh, see this, then, then we will probably schedule uh, uh, more workshops. Um, yeah, and we also give away IQ awards if you have a, a cool project that you uh, think that uh, would, would be nice to demonstrate what, what, uh, what the IQ board can do, uh, then we are all for it and we'll give you um, a board. Yeah, thank you. All right, so we have a good 10 minutes of uh, questions and answers time left. So if you have questions for Clifford, please come to one of the microphones uh, in the hall. Um, so everybody, even the people uh, watching the video or the stream can hear you. Um, and while you are lining up at the microphones, we're gonna start with a question from the signal angel, please. Thank you. And Sarutian wants to know, he has a question about partial reconfiguration of FPGAs with higher amount of gates. Does the ICE lattice series have internal configuration ports like the Silings FPGA do? Um, short answer, no. Uh, there is nothing that you can do for, for partial reconfiguration. Um, however, uh, there is uh, an internal board called, called Warm Boot that can be used to reconfigure the entire FPGA from the FPGA. So it has uh, two select pins and one trigger pin, and if you uh, assert the trigger pin, then the two select pins will, will specify which of up to four bit streams will be loaded in, in the FPGA. So this is possible, but you can't partially reconfigure uh, a device while it's running. Okay, all right, then we're gonna um, go ahead with mic one. Uh, you said when you first started you got some uh, emails about the, the IP. Have your relations with Lattice improved since then? Oh, this was not from, from Lattice. Uh, this was just, just from, a, from a random guy uh, who, I don't know, saw it on, on Hacky Day that, uh, that, that I have done this and, and he apparently took it very personally uh, and, and, and thought I'm, I'm after his IP and, and so he sent me an email. Uh, and, and actually wrote that I should go to jail for what I did. Uh, it was quite an interesting experience. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna mix in another question from IRC or Twitter. Chris wants to know whether the error messages are comprehensive. <laughs> for example, no resources left or clock tree is not feasible. Um, um, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, I think for all stages of of, of the flow, the error messages could be better. Um, 
I, I know it in particular for Joseph, and in Joseph there is a lot of, 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 of room for improvement for things like uh, uh, the input is not actually very low code. Usually you just get syntax error in line so and so, and then maybe it's plus minus five lines uh, because uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's how parsers are. Um, so, so the error reporting is not very good, but, uh, but usually you get an error uh, that, that with at least some, some experience you can track back to the, to the problem. Okay, perfect. Uh, Mike five, please. Yeah, I would like to know a little more about uh, VHDL support. So you mentioned it shortly, but is there a schedule when VHDL will be supported? No. Uh, right at, at the moment, uh, there is someone working on it, but I think there is no code yet. Um, there are two, two ideas how to support VHDL. Uh, one, one is uh, we could write a new VHDL frontend, and uh, the, the student who is interested in in writing a VHDL front that is going to, to uh, follow this approach. The, the other possibility would be to use some kind of VHDL to Verilog translator. Uh, and um, there is an interesting project that is part of Icarus Verilog, which is a VHDL PP, uh, which is a preprocessor to convert uh, behavioral VHDL into behavioral Verilog. And when you do that, you actually can't do that. You need to add more features to, to Verilog because the simulation models are a little bit different. But with synthesizable code, it should actually be possible to convert synthesizable VHDL to synthesizable Verilog. So maybe it would be possible to like hack this tool uh, to, uh, to do that. Uh, but, but I am personally not working on, on either of those uh, because I'm totally happy with Verilog. Uh, but I think that's my personal preference. <laughs> All right. Um, another question from the interwebs. Uh, Mo2000 wants to know how powerful is your processor from the demo in terms of registers and memory? Okay, so it's a, it's a RISC-V uh, processor. Uh, and, and if you've never heard of RISC-V before, it, it's, it's a really, really cool project uh, that aims at creating uh, an open instruction set architecture that is free of, of any uh, IP claims. So you can implement powerful processors uh, with, with, with that instruction set architecture. The processor I have here is the Pico RV32. It's, it's a project of mine. And it's not very powerful because it's optimized for size. So um, um, I, here I think it's, it's less than, than 2,000 uh, lookup tables uh, on Xilinx 7 series, which is my, my prime target architecture for this uh, chip in the smallest configuration. It's smaller than 750 lookup tables. Uh, so it's a really, really small processor, but it will uh, take uh, four cycles approximately for each instruction. It varies a little bit. Uh, on the good side, it, you can clock it with up to 400 megahertz. So a lot of FPGA processors only go to something like 60 megahertz, and then uh, it, it evens out a little bit. Uh, RISC-V is a 32-bit instruction set, and regarding the registers, it has 32 general purpose registers. Uh, uh, 31 because one is a zero register that always has zero and writes to it that I ignore it. Okay, all right. We still have uh, time left, so we're going to go over to Mike Four with the next question. Yeah, I'm totally happy to, to see that such an accessible and open uh, uh, project for, for teaching at a children's school or in the classroom. How, uh, how our modern day process works from, from really from the specification of the processor to, to the output pins and it allows for in a very cheap way to, to really understand this, to teach this. This is awesome. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm wondering, you mentioned that an interest of yours is especially this verification and I wonder whether this can be shown on the, on the uh, level of the processor you mentioned. Also is that a real size where you can say, oh, my output pin on the processor uh, went to, to high and low, and can you, can you verify on that size? Um, there are certain uh, verification tasks that I can run on my processor. Uh, generally, uh, processors are hard to formally verify because there is this huge divergence of control flow you inherently have on a processor. Uh, but uh, there are things that I do, like uh, as I've, I think, mentioned, uh, uh, the processor is configurable, so there are features you can turn on and turn off. Um, and I have a formal proof that says uh, when I have two sets of, of, of features, 
uh, and the, uh, the and I only look at se sequences of instructions that don't uh, let the, the, the less powerful feature set process or trap, then the more powerful must always have the same behavior. Uh, and this is a kind of proof that I can actually do with, with users right now. Okay, before we go to the next question, just a quick ask to the people in the room coming in or leaving, please be as quiet as possible so we can finish the Q&A. Uh, Mike Five, please. I want to say thank you very much for doing this work uh, to you and to Cotton Seed. I think this is this is the equivalent of the first version of GCC, but for hardware. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. All right, then we'll just stay with Mike Five. Um, yeah, um, great project. But what about uh, timing validation and timing uh, during place and route? Yeah, right now, uh, none of our processes are really timing driven. There are some, some very weak timing driven optimizations and the high level stuff. You just know it's better to do this structure wide instead of deep and things like that. Uh, right now, the place and route stuff is not timing driven uh, because we are still working on, on, on creating timing models. Uh, but this is almost finished. Um, um, there are some technical difficulties. Uh, I, I think it's not, not the right uh, moment now to discuss them, uh, but uh, I invite you to come to our assembly and I would be happy to talk about it. All right, then uh, we're going to give the people who are not able to be in the room another uh, chance to ask. Thank you. How does Lattice think about your open source flow? Are you in contact and what's coming next? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, so if, if anyone from Lattice is here, please see me. Uh, um, I, I would like to reach out to Lattice as soon as I have uh, a working timing flow, uh, because that's the one thing that's still missing right now. Uh, and in my experience with all these projects, with Yoses and all the other stuff, whenever I, I approach some kind of commercial entity, they just don't believe that I can do what I say I, I will do. Uh, so I would like to have a complete flow that is really production ready and, and then say, uh, here it is, maybe you would like to work with me together to, to improve uh, on it. Okay, two more minutes, so to get as many questions in as possible, please make it short and precise. Mike, two, please. Hi. Hello. Uh, do you think it would be feasible to design and fabricate a independent FPGA that would be compatible with this bit file format uh, using open macro libraries? Um, I, I think it would be possible, uh, but um, it, it would be not really much harder to just make your own uh, FPGA design and use these tools uh, and, and create a database similar to the database we are using here uh, and, and, and things like that. And there are actually uh, uh, projects going on right now where we're thinking about uh, doing stuff like that, creating our own FPGA. So for me, uh, this is of course interesting to, to really have support for an FPGA, but it was also uh, um, important so I, can, so I can just show that my tool chain can, can deliver. Uh, over 10 years ago, I tried to uh, approach some ASIC companies uh, and, and convince them to build an, an open source FPGA. And essentially, all they told me is it's completely impossible because we will never have the open source tool chain. Now we have the open source tool chain, so I can go back to that and see if we can get an open source FPGA fabricated. Okay, and I think our last question is coming from uh, someone watching the stream again. Actually, I have two. One is, can you run Oberon OS? And the second one is, would you think it would be possible to leverage your work on the FPGA device to reverse engineer other devices? Uh, how would an approach look like? Um, uh, I looked into the, the, the Oberon uh, HDL designs. Uh, I can process them with Verilog. Uh, in their default configuration, they, they would like to use uh, multiplier primitives that are xilinx specific. So it, that would be something that would need some changes, but, but it, it should be possible. And the 8K FPGA, I think, should also be large enough uh, for, for the Oberon thing. Um, I didn't really get the second part of the question, but I think we're out of time anyway. 
Yeah, but um, you shared your contact details, so uh, people uh, here who still have questions and also people from the internet can probably get in contact with you. So uh, thanks Clifford for the talk. Thanks for the people asking. Thanks for having me.